Hello, and welcome again to another edition of the Video Health Research Report. We have three fast reports we're going to go through today. And the first one, let's put it this way. Who hasn't had problems with a crying baby before? Well, obviously there's a lot of things like colic, we should say, reflux, constipation, so on and so forth. And now you've got an idea of where I'm going. Well, if you wanted to reduce the average crying time, this poor infant that may have those conditions, such as colic or constipation, from 71 minutes down to 38 minutes per day, or say the average crying time of 38 minutes, would that be worth it to you? And if it could be done in a healthy manner, would that also be worth even more to you? Well, ironically, or I should say thankfully, through a probiotic called Lactobillus ruteri, which is a naturally occurring probiotic which can be purchased in stores, or I should say health food stores, they were able to do this. Now what they did is that this came from the University of Bari, Italy. What they looked at was 554 newborns, and they gave them pro uh, the probiotic Lactobillus ruteri, or placebo for 90 days. At three months of age, the average duration of crying time when it was 38 minutes for the lactobillus group versus 71 minutes for the, for the placebo group. Which is kind of interesting because if you look at infants, do they really know if they're taking a placebo or not? Or maybe their concern was the mother or parents. Uh, regurgitations were two regurgitations were 2.9 versus 4.6 for the uh, the uh, lactobillus ruteri group compared to the placebo group, and evacuations per day were 4.2 versus 3.6. I think you understand what I mean by evacuations in the probiotic and placebo groups, respectively. The probiotic use was associated with nearly $119 average savings per patient in each family. So here we look at this one. When you actually have to purchase something, but yet it saves you money in the long run in hospital visits, emergency room visits, and so on and so forth, or visits to the doctor. And on top of that, if you're thinking of reducing the average crying time down to 38 minutes versus 71 minutes, lactobillus ruteri seems like a really cool thing that you need to discuss with your doctor or research and institute yourself. And it's pretty incredible. Again, lactobillus ruteri. I'm not talking Lactobillus acidophilus or other forms of Lactobillus. Probiotics or acidophilus is many different strains. So, when the opportunity arises, make sure it's a Lactobillus REU. Uh, I can pronounce the T E R I. Lactobillus ruteri. Just want to make sure I had it spelled right. And now we go to advanced prostate cancer. Now, normally, I probably wouldn't have brought this one up because melatonin to me is a pretty rudimentary item. But when melatonin reduced the risk of advanced prostate cancer by 75%, it was worth mentioning. Again, this was announced at the Prostate Cancer Foundation Conference on Advances in Prostate Cancer Research held January 18th up to the 21st, even though today is the 20th. I guess the conference is still going on, on melatonin. And they are saying that many biological processes are regulated by the circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm means your night cycle, you fall asleep at a certain time, you wake up at a certain time, so on and so forth. The rhythm including the sleep-wake cycle. Melatonin may play a role in regulating a range of other hormones that influence certain cancers including breast and prostate cancer. This goes back to often when you look at night shift workers being more prone to cancer and that, through observation, led them obviously to what was different is circadian rhythms got thrown out of whack, and so forth, the melatonin levels got thrown out of whack. So we found that men who had higher levels of melatonin had a 75% reduced risk for developing advanced prostate cancer compared with men who had lower levels of melatonin. Our results require replication. Like any good scientific experiment, you have to be able to re reproduce it but support the public health implication of the importance of maintaining stable light, dark, and sleep-wake cycles. Because melatonin levels are potentially modifiable, i.e. supplementation, 
Further studies of melatonin and prostate cancer risk and progression are warranted. These researchers found, interesting side note still, that one in seven men reported problems falling asleep, one in five men reported problems staying asleep, and one in three reported taking medications for sleep. Interesting. And then after that, something even more important for fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia sufferers. And it has to do with pain. And then this was published in the January issue, or is it January, or current issue of pain. And that's the name of the publication. Researchers hypothesized that vitamin D supplementation reduced the degree of chronic pain experienced by fibromyalgia sufferers, in their words, FMS, with lower levels of vitamin D. I'm not going to use the chemical term, just use vitamin D for simplicity. <clears throat> it also might improve other symptoms. Low blood levels of vitamin D are especially common in patients with severe pain and fibromyalgia. 24 weeks after supplementation was stopped, a marked reduction in the level of perceived pain occurred in the treatment group, treatment group being the ones that got the vitamin D, between the first and the 25th week on supplementation, meaning it took anywhere from 1 to 25 weeks to kick in. The treatment group improved significantly on a scale of physical role functioning while the placebo group remained unchanged. The treatment group also scored significantly better on the fibromyalgia impact questionnaire, otherwise known as FIQ, on the question of morning fatigue. However, there were no significant alterations in depression or anxiety symptoms. Well, neither the vitamin D took care of the pain and helped reduce the severity of the pain, but it didn't necessarily make a difference in the mood or anxiety on sufferers. We believe the data presented in the present study are promising. Fibromyalgia sufferers is a very extensive symptom and complex that cannot be explained by a vitamin D deficiency alone. However, vitamin D supplementation may be regarded as a relatively safe and economical treatment for FMS patients and an extremely cost-effective alternative or adjunct to expensive pharmacological treatment as well as physical, behavioral, and multimodal therapies, meaning drugs, therapy, so on and so forth, just anything you can hit at it except give vitamin D. Vitamin D levels should be monitored regularly in FMS patients, especially in the winter season and raised appropriately, which is something interesting to think about if the pain is worse during the fall and winter because the lack of light, henceforth, lack of natural vitamin D production itself, provided that person is not doing sunscreen at that time at the same time. So again, fibromyalgia syndrome, otherwise known as FMS. Vitamin D made a difference in those sufferers between one to 25 weeks, and it seemed to be a good alternative or adjunct to a lot of other therapies that FMS patients may be going through. Definitely very inexpensive and worth a shot. Again, short edition of the Video Health Research Report, this 20th January, 2014. And as always, I appreciate you listening. All right, guys, I'll catch you again next week. Bye.